seminary, we're going to, <laughs> and there you get the warning, <laughs> which I think it's a good actually. Um, we're going to be starting off uh, the plenary with uh, an update from our uh, GRA special representative, uh, Hayden Montgomery. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry for my clumsiness. I'll just um, screen share. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. So I will stop my video as, just in case because we had some bandwidth issues in the earlier meeting, and I think it's better not to see me and, and, and see the presentation and hear the audio. Um, so, yeah, well, um, good, well, good evening from me, but I guess morning for some and, and late evening for others. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and um, just to provide a very, very brief, um, pretty high level update on sort of general GRA developments, at least from the Secretariat kind of perspective. Um, and I'm conscious, of course, we're going to hear from, um, you know, well, we've heard from countries already in one session, we'll have country presentations coming up in another session and um, we'll hear from networks. So I don't want to sort of say anything that they are likely to say. So I've tried to think of things that won't, won't hopefully be mentioned by others. Um, and I'll just work through this very quickly and I'll, I'll try and move fairly fast and then have some time for any questions or clarifications if, if needed. Um, so I think just in case uh, we have people who are, who are new to the GRA, um, I just wanted to kind of capture the essence of it on one slide for you. Um, so, you know, as, as many of us know, we're, we're here about, um, you know, trying to form collaborations to increase the investment and in research to reduce the emissions intensity of agricultural production systems and increase the potential for soil carbon sequestration. Uh, we're here for the integrated research group and we have uh, three other research groups looking at croplands, livestock and paddy rice. And, um, at least in my opinion about us uh, here on the bottom right um you know obviously coordination is a key aspect um we're we're of course trying to find those highest priorities across the the whole membership so identify those issues that would be of the greatest value to to everybody or as many as possible and and i'm 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 pleased and i think we all have this intent of it is to maintain a higher scientific rigor with the work we do um, and, and sort of sure we're adding value to the, you know, the scientific um, literature and um, you know, knowledge out there rather than sort of maybe some questionable claims that are often made by less rigorous groups. Um, and I guess the characteristics of the GRA are such that, you know, we're bringing together um, governments and their associated research institutions. And on that I mean, you know, all research institutions, including universities. Um, and that's really important when we consider that one of the um, really important objectives uh, our members have is to uh, support their own processes towards their nationally determined contributions and other national and international policy processes that they're, they're involved in. Um, in terms of some recent event, um, many will know, but not necessarily all of you, the 10th annual council meeting was held in the end of March this year. Um, and at that meeting, uh, hosted by Australia on, uh, online, um, Australia assumed, assumed the chair of the council and will be our council chair for the next year. <clears throat> and Chile was uh, confirmed as the vice chair and would um, take on the chair and host the council meeting in 2022. Um, this is not everything that was discussed in the council meeting, um, so I don't want to give the impression that it's limited to just these two kind of things, but I think these are quite important for, for orienting the, the work of the, the research groups. Uh, and that is the second strategic plan of the GRA was adopted um, at that meeting, and that was a process that had been um, sort of worked on for many months leading up to the council meeting. And in that strategic plan, amongst other things, I've just pulled out some, some particular highlights. Um, one is that the GRA, we as, a, we as a community, aim to be the leading or a leading global initiative advancing scientific research on mitigation. Yeah. And there are a few other elements, uh, such as a focus on early career scientists and building their capability. And uh, I've just got some examples of programs that I certainly consider are um, oriented towards that, that end. And that is the Cliff Grads program that many of you will be aware of. Um, there was a need to communicate the impact we're having. Um, this could be in terms of impact on emissions, but also impact that being a member of the GRA means for the member itself. You know, how, is, how is participation over the, over the years transforming the way 
research priorities are set, funding is allocated, um, you know, uh, alignment with other countries through the GRA forum. Um, there's a real, real consciousness of the need for the work we do to be policy relevant. And one of the ideas that's been discussed, um, well, for, for a while now is, is whether we can start to produce uh, policy briefs or those sorts of things to inform uh, policy makers. And resourcing, of course, is always a priority, um, but we are starting to have some uh, more opportunities emerge with uh, joint calls and the like, where those calls can provide opportunities for funding for, for our members to get involved in, in uh, projects that would be aligned with GRA priorities. Then um, linked to the strategic plan, we have an operational plan, which we haven't finalised yet, but it's in the, in the sort of final drafting stages. And just some of the elements included in that, uh, and, and this is an annual plan, so this is action oriented and one that we would hope to complete within the calendar year uh, or within the 12 month period, better, better put. Um, some of the elements identified um, uh, from our members was uh, trying to look at better cooperation between ministries of the member countries and also the coordination between science and policy, uh, which would assist greatly in the policy development process. Um, we continue to have um, interest in developing what we call our flagship research uh, areas or, or projects. And one was presented in particular, which I think will probably be discussed here as well. Um, and this is the International Research Consortium on Soil Organic Carbon. Um, and then, of course, there are some big summits happening this year that are extremely relevant to the work of the GRA. So the Food System Summit um, and associated events in the lead up to the later in the year. And then the COP uh, in Glasgow. Uh, including the coronavirus joint work on agriculture. So these were discussed in the context of the council meeting and, and uh, obviously a strong interest to see how we can be visible in those, in those processes and ensure that the work we're doing is, is available to, the, to people. Um, and then finally, and this is a really important one, so get ready, um, there was a strong desire for a stock take of, of activity I've just put here. Um, now this is to be defined exactly what we would include in the stock take and to what extent it is looking backwards or looking forwards, but um, the research group co-chairs have started to discuss this and will be um, preparing the kind of framework of that stock take um, to make it as useful as possible for us in the GRA to, I, I hope at least, enable us to, to better plan future activities based on a better understanding of, of what's going on within the, the various members and partners we have. Um, you know, I should note that the, the only other stock take we did was at the beginning of the GRA back in, well, 20. 10 or 11 probably when we, when we undertook that activity. So it's 10 years since, since that was done and a lot will have changed. Um, another really useful uh, or well, important announcement if others haven't read the website is we have now 65 member countries. Uh, Cuba joined uh, soon after the council meeting. So that's really great. And um, obviously we continue to promote the GRA to countries that aren't members and, and hope over time we'll continue to see growth in the membership and also growth in the, in the engagement of our existing members, of course. Um, the Secretariat is also undergoing some changes. Um, you'll know, well, you know me, you know Deb. Um, we also have uh, other colleagues um, in, in New Zealand, in the ministry, Hazel and uh, Akeem, um, I don't want to miss names here, um, that, that work on the Secretariat. Um, we have um, uh, Nina in, in the Penin Institute in Germany, who's, who's working, uh, supporting us from Europe. And we have uh, Nicolas Costa in, in the Uruguayan Ministry of Livestock and Agriculture and Fisheries um, also supporting us. And in addition, we're really pleased to let you know that we have um, additional staff in the New Zealand Ministry in Wellington um, with Veronica Ellis, who I think might be on this, on this call. And also just recently, um, we've contracted Katia Besanova, who is based at the Ryan Institute at the National University of Ireland, Galway. And she is contracted to take on the administration of the CliffGrad program. After many years, Aarhus University has, um, well, basically they can't continue to act as administrator. So um, the Ryan Institute has, has offered to do that and, and Kachi has been hired for that role. But about three quarters of her role will be focused on GRA scholarships and awards. And that is to assist in all of the scholarships and awards that we have explicitly linked to the GRA, but also to actually support us to know what else is out there um, in member countries and partner organizations and try and make all of these opportunities uh, visible to, to our members and partners and you know, early career scientists, um, whether they be full scholarships for PhDs or postdocs or whether they be mobility funding when we can travel again or, or training awards, whatever that is, um, try to 
enable the GRA to act more of the clearinghouse for, for all those activities um, that are relevant to the work we do. So Cut has just started like a week ago and um, we're looking forward to having her full time as well to help us out. Um, a few other things, um, and I'm not gonna, this is not exhaustive at all, but um, I would encourage you to look at the GRA website, um, the updates page, and also the library, which was, has an improved search functionality. Um, obviously with COVID, we've turned to the online world more, and there have been a number of webinars and, and online meetings um, happening over, well, the last, seems too long, 18 months almost. Um, and uh, one recently with Thierry, um, uh, presenting some new tools for um, quantification of greenhouse gases and rice paddies and also uh, assessment of mitigation potential and, and cost benefit of, of actions to reduce emissions. Um, we had uh, a virtual farmers tour as normally happened in person every every year but of course that's not possible this year so it went virtual um, and I should add actually that the Australian Council meeting had a really good virtual uh, tour as well of some some really great work going on in farmers uh, of, in, in, yeah, by farmers in, in Australia. Uh, and then we also had a webinar in the Cochrane's group on full inversion tillage, which was really well attended. Um, so, you know, these are not all, it's just a, a selection, and I'm sure you hear more from the networks later on, but, you know, just to note that the website has, has all these things uploaded and recorded and forever, forever able to be accessed. Um, the, the perennial reminder, um, country pages. Uh, this is your space on the GRA website. So we have this uh, tool, which is, to be honest, not the best tool in the world, but it, it's, it's functional. Um, and uh, each country that is a member is, is there on that um, page. And we invite countries to submit information to the Secretariat that can be uploaded to your page. That can be information about your country's agricultural system, the circumstances, uh, your country science participation and research activities, capability building, job opportunities, funding programs, your priorities your country contacts, if you wish to make those uh, available on the website, um, that's very helpful for the council, for the research groups, for the networks, and whatever else you consider to be useful. Um, there are some really good examples uh, of country pages, um, which you can navigate and search for, and there are some big gaps. So it'd be really great if, if you, as uh, representatives of, of your countries in the integrated research group, could take that message back to your other colleagues and the other groups and in the council and and uh, submit to the Secretariat any, anything you'd like to be um, uploaded and of course the Secretariat is very happy to help you with that process and make it as, as simple as possible. Um, I think this is the last slide. Um, in terms of research calls, um, the GRA participated directly in a couple of research calls. One has closed recently, uh, it was on circularity and mixed crops and livestock farming systems um, and it was uh, the participation of the GRA uh, permitted developing country members of the GRA to request funds to allow them to be part of research consortia and, and research project proposals. So there were a number of requests, so it was really great. Um, we just have to wait now for the evaluation process and decisions to be taken later in the year. And a very similar process, but a, a call linked to the European Joint Programme on Soil, an, an external call, and this allows um, non-EU member states um, and other um, EU uh, funders but not partners of EJP to, to fund research and uh, this is a call that's open now. The pre-registration of proposals uh, is due actually tomorrow, Europe time, um, um, and the, the final submission of proposals later in the year and uh, again the GRA is making funding available uh, for developing country members to request to be part of project proposals and I would encourage everyone to make good use of that. Um, that's it from me. Um, please, you know, we have our email there for the Secretariat. Um, please follow both the GRA and myself on Twitter. We try to tweet, tweet relevant things. And if, if we know you're out there tweeting relevant things, we'll retweet and, you know, it helps to build momentum of, of the work we're doing and give visibility to it. So um, thank you very much for your attention. That's great, Hayden. Thanks for that overview of where the council is at. Any questions for Hayden? Oh, I see a couple of questions. Um, chat, yeah, well, in the chat too. Okay, I see. Let's start with uh, Pete, maybe, Peter Smith. I was clapping. That's not a hand. Oh, you're clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Maybe that was Roland's end too. Okay, there is a hand up though with Olia Glad. Uh, Olia Glad, thank you. Um, 
Oh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the interesting and informative presentation. I have one question. Um, you have a very useful page on your website uh, for the car for the countries to put uh, their activities in updates, etc. But I was wondering if it's uh, possible to have partners page as well, because it's not just countries, it's organizations who are partnering with you that might want to put some interesting announcement, which would be relevant to everyone else. Yes. So in terms of announcements, absolutely. Um, we we often receive information from partners and we make that public on the on the website through a news item. Um, in terms of the country page as a more permanent fixture um, and the idea of partners pages, I might need Deb to help me on this because I know you can select in the in that tool I showed the partners that are you know partners of the GRA, but I just can't recall if we have a space for them on, on the website. But that was discussed earlier today in, the, in one of the country sectors as well, um, where we had a partner from the CGIR. Um, so, you know, we could look at that and try and make that functionality maybe available. Um, but certainly, you know, news and events or announcements, anything like that, absolutely. We can, we can make those, make those as, a, as an update or a news item on the website and they will be there on the website and, and sort of archived. Um, but yeah, it's a good point. Um, that was raised earlier as well about, you know, on this page. Thank we'll, you. We'll put a, yeah, we'll make a note of that and we'll, we'll, we'll look into that. Thank you very much. Okay, and Jean-Francois, do you want to make a comment too? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Hayden. Um, well, actually, uh, we heard uh, at a recent uh, G20 meeting about uh, a new program uh, that will be uh, launched, uh, to my understanding, at the COP26 in Glasgow, and uh, which is, uh, uh, I think, based on a proposal by US, uh, and the name is uh, Aim for Climate. And uh, I was wondering uh, if you had any comments at this stage, because uh, I think it's a sort of new player in the uh, uh, arena of international programs on climate change and agriculture. Yeah, great question, Jean-François. Um, yeah, we're absolutely aware of that and um, have had discussions with um, the proponents of that, um, that initiative. It's still in the process of being developed for launch at COP, as you say. Um, now, of course, it's kind of up to the, the I guess, the members or, or the way it's formed, whatever that will be called, to decide. But my understanding at this stage is, is that the primary focus of that is a very high level political commitment to investment in research, both through uh, public research um, and national, you know, national systems of research, uh, through international research uh, uh, platforms, uh, which I GRA, of course, is one, CGI will be others come to mind, uh, and also um, the prospect to, to leverage private sector investment. Um, that is the primary focus of the, of the initiative. It is that political commitment to spend more in science for, for agriculture and climate change. Um, beyond that, I think it's up to the, it's up to the proponents and, and, other, and other, others involved to design it. But certainly, of course, as a GRA, um, having been established you know, some time ago, I would say a, a useful platform. Obviously, it can be improved always in terms of efficiency and coordination, but but a useful platform. We would see the GRA being, um, you know, a very good uh, vehicle through which to invest, you know, through through the sort of groups and networks we've established. So that's pretty much what I could say. I mean, others who are close to the field and proponents of it may have comments to add, but but that's what I know. And um, yeah, obviously, following with a close interest. Yeah. yeah. Okay. As much as we know now. On the IRC, but yeah, exactly. That'll be picked up by Sean Francois. Yeah, and I think with that, we'll move to the uh, presentations by our various network leads. And we do have uh, Peter Smith from uh, University of Aberdeen, who is a co-lead of the Soil Carbon Sequestration Network. Um, and he might be addressing some of those questions about soil carbon for us. Thanks, Paola. Uh, so yes, I'll talk about what we've been doing in the soil carbon uh, sequestration network. Just get that. Hopefully you can see that full screen now. Looks yeah. good. So um, most of the work has been leading up to the Soil Organic Carbon um, IRC, um, International Research Consortium. Um, but we're saving the details of that for tomorrow. Jean-Francois is going to present, present that 
in plenary two. So I'm hope, hoping that you can attend plenary two where you'll hear more about it. But a lot of the work that we've been doing is leading up to that. And a lot of it's taken place um, through a project coordinated in Europe called SACASA. Um, we received money from uh, the European Union over the last uh, two or three years to, to, to run this SACASA project. Jean-Francois was the, Jean-Francois Rosanna was the um, coordinator, um, but we, uh, it was funded in Europe, but we had partners from all over the world. So I'll just present some of the things that we've been doing that have contributed to the soil carbon sequestration network so that you can see where we're up to. Uh, the first thing we did is we consulted um, everybody who had an interest in soil carbon. Um, so we consulted um, online, we sent out questionnaires and we got uh, 211 responses. We got responses from all continents and there was a strong representation from agricultural uh, practice, soil and land management and researchers. But there was a poor representation from social science disciplines. So we recognize this as a gap and that's something that we'd like to address in the IRC, but more on that tomorrow. Uh, we classified um, the, the research challenges um, uh, as, as provided by the, the questionnaires into three, the, uh, three themes, uh, one on the soil processes, one on management and monitoring, and one on barriers. And you can just see some examples of um, uh, particular challenges, uh, 14 challenges indeed, uh, but how they fit under the, each of those different categories. So for example, uh, deep soil stabilization came up under manage, management and monitoring. Um, prevention of soil organic loss came up under barriers and uh, stabilization of soil carbon, as for example, came up under soil processes. We then took these research themes and we had a look, at, um, we tried to see what the scientific, scientific and technical evidence there was in the literature to inform us on each of these um, topics so that we could identify how well they're covered already in the literature and what we needed to focus on in the future. So we, we did a, a large matter analysis of over 14,000 journal articles and it allowed us to do two things. Firstly, to map out uh, where, where the centers of activity are in the world. Uh, and you can see that there's a large, a large uh, amount of uh, research going on in the Chinese Academy of Sciences um, and in China. Um, and that's something where we've got some representation, but not as great as it could be. Um, so we'd like to like to build bridges uh, with China from the great research that's going on there. And the other thing that I think is worth noting is um, how many fitted into the themes. So I mentioned the themes that we uh, the, the themes that came up um, from the uh, questionnaires at the beginning, um, but only nine point four percent of um, Publications deal with soil processes, only 8.7% soil monitoring, 8% soil management, and only about 2% on barriers. So um, we, we recognize that, you know, we've got some activity going on in this area, um, but the, the research themes aren't by any means captured uh, entirely very well by the, by the literature that's out there. Um, other work we've been doing is we've been uh, looking at the uh, four per mil aspirational targets to see how well they could be uh, how well they could be met and and what the barriers are. So uh, we we've been doing some work with uh, Global Epic and Rothsey, um, which is a, a soil organic carbon decomposition model, as most of you all know, um, to look and see um, uh, what the potential is uh, for soil carbon sequestration in tons of carbon per year. And as you can see, there's quite a large uh, range of uh, pot uh, potentials there, some of them with significant potential for gains in soil carbon. So um, in these regions that are shown in red, um, we could, um, we could um, easily meet the four, four per mil targets. But other areas uh, where it's shown in blue and green, it would be more difficult to meet the four per mil targets. And we're also able to quantify the costs. Um, so using this same framework, um, we could look, for example, here are two, um, the cost per hectare of um, uh, changing from uh, conventional tillage to no-till. And you can see the areas in blue um, are showing a, a cost. Um, the areas in red are showing a negative cost. 
uh, so you could actually save money. Um, but there's a quite significant difference um, in different areas of the world, um, but also differences between the crops. So we've got corn at the top and wheat at the bottom, so that you can see that they, it doesn't only vary regionally, but it depends on, on which crop you're trying to apply uh, these practices to. And another activity, uh, the last one that I'll talk about, and then I'll hand over to Jean Francois, who will talk about some of the other things that we've been doing in Sacasa, um, was to um, we got together with the Soil Carbon Sequestration Network, which I'm now representing, um, but also with Sacasa um, and other members of the GRA, um, to put together a paper on uh, monitoring, verification, and reporting needs. Um, for soil carbon. This is uh, regarded as one of the most significant barriers for implementing widespread carbon sequestration. So we nearly we really need to make inroads into MRV. Um, so we put together this paper which um, looked, um, this is uh, just an example of which countries are using which tiers, tier one, two or three, with three being uh, more complex modelling uh, tiers and tier one being just uh, IPCC default values and then we've included some management activities here to map out what different GRA countries are doing um, and which ones are using different tiers and also as part of this paper we were able to propose a, uh, a platform an idealized platform of what, what might a global framework for MRV look like for soil carbon change and we published this in Global Change Biology. Um, it came out in print actually in uh, uh, 2020. Um, but this, this just maps out that we've got long-term experiments, we've got short-term experiments. Each of these can be used to calibrate and to, to um, validate models, um, which we can use to project changes. We can uh, use remote sensing to provide activity data, but also to verify some of the activity data. And then we've got these um, uh, soil resampling surveys, uh, activity data, as well as spatial data sets. All of these components exist to some extent. In different parts of the world, they uh, exist um, to, a different, uh, to a different extent. Uh, for example, uh, North America and Europe and uh, China have some very well-developed um, uh, activity data and, um, and long-term experiments, but um, predominantly in the tropics and in developing, uh, developing countries in tropical regions, they tend to have less coverage. But this shows that we have um, components of this MRV system available in some areas of the world. We need to fill in the gaps and we can pull them together to, to um, provide um, either national or even at, at some stage in the future, a global MRV platform uh, to verify and monitor and report our soil carbon. I'm going to hand over to Jean-Francois now um, to talk through the next few slides. So Jean-Francois, if you could unmute and tell me when to move on to the next slide, please. Yes, thank you, Pete. Um, so we also had a stakeholder consultation to un understand the needs for knowledge by stakeholders. Uh, this was run through an online survey in seven languages, uh, given uh, the uh, need uh, to have a global coverage. And uh, we got a large number of respondents, uh, close uh, to uh, 1,400. Um, and uh, this was uh, including farmers. It is uh, worthwhile to note that there was uh, a special case, like a case study in Denmark, uh, because we could have access to uh, a large fraction of the Danish farmers. Uh, so there we could really have a representative sample. Uh, and uh, we organized 10 regional workshops, and these were organized by the Circasa partners uh, and uh, in some of your countries, like in Brazil, uh, in Russia, in China, in Australia, in Africa, uh, and, and other places in Canada also and US and in Europe, obviously. So what we uh, were asking is uh, what sort of knowledge is needed by farmers, on the one hand, by other stakeholders, uh, on the other, um, what sort of knowledge is available but not accessible locally, and what new research is needed. Next slide. 
So interestingly, uh, this is a share of responses per theme, where you see that there is a large fraction uh, pointing to needs uh, of knowledge at the farm level for the management of the soils. <clears throat> a large fraction pointing at knowledge transfer and exchange. So this was uh, really showing that uh, knowledge that is in fact available internationally is not readily transferable to local conditions. And uh, therefore you need to have some co-design of how you work with that knowledge with the local users. Uh, a number of users, especially farmers, ask for more about costing, about economics, and uh, some, mostly uh, other stakeholders and farmers, were asking for policy solutions. And a bit surprisingly, the need for more knowledge about monitoring, reporting, and verifying was only a relatively small fraction of the total. Next slide. So we, we came with uh, dominant views by farmers and farm advisors about the costs and benefits of the soil organic carbon management. Uh, the benefits in terms of productivity, of yields, uh, of water possibly, or possibly higher costs for uh, irrigation, uh, but also the financial returns, uh, the impacts on the neat income, and the risks, trade-offs, the labor involved and the efforts involved. So it was very apparent that farmers were thinking that it would not be easy to transition to systems where you would increase your soil carbon and actually uh, de-risking strategies, uh, including through some financial instruments, were seen as extremely important. Also extremely important was the crop choice, a local combination of practices that could be used uh, to get uh, an increase in soil carbon. In contrast, the other stakeholders were looking more broadly into the societal and env environmental benefits. Uh, how could we incentivize the improved uh, soil organic carbon management? How could we also get better monitoring, reporting, verification at a reasonable cost? And what would be the implications of the changes in the farming system uh, in the industry, for the industries, how would the uh, value chains uh, be transformed? Uh, so these were sort of broader questions by other stakeholders. Next slide. Something blocked. Sorry, Jean-Francois, it won't advance. I'll try sharing again. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so, yes, uh, I think it was really an interesting uh, process and it was led uh, by uh, Anna Freely Larson at uh, Ecolchik uh, with support uh, of uh, Aarhus University with Jurgen Olsen and others. And uh, really this exercise uh, was showing that uh, research is only a small fraction of the knowledge needed. So we do need to have uh, actions to enable access to existing knowledge, to co-create knowledge with the users uh, to have better alignment of research with the knowledge needs, and also to create tailored guidance uh, with contextual place-based knowledge. So I think this was a clear insight we got from those, uh, um, well, those interactions with the stakeholders and the farmers. Thank you. And I think this uh, may well be the last slide, Pete, or maybe there is just thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Jean Francois. Yes, thank you thank to you both of you. Us. We're done. Yes, I saw the last slide there. Um, I, we're just a little behind. I, we do have one question in the chat here. Um, they compose. It was brought up with um, uh, your survey, I guess. And the question here from Roland is: What knowledge is is that knowledge needed because it's not present? This is the question from the farmers. I think. Um, that they wanted knowledge um, is it because it's not present or knowledge because of their curiosity. 
Hmm. If that's not clear, Roland, that's... maybe you have to answer. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So certainly there is a large diversity in the answers from farmers, but what they are asking for is knowledge that is readily actionable, if I can say. So something they can use. And uh, for them, uh, there is a big gap between the sort of academic papers we're producing and the knowledge they can readily use. So this sort of translation, translation effort or also the co-design of knowledge with the users, with the farmers, is really a strong demand they have. And uh, you could argue this is because extension services are not possibly doing the job. I don't know. But this is a relatively new area. And uh, it shows that uh, unless uh, we uh, have uh, really uh, some uh, innovation in the way we co-design knowledge, we transfer knowledge, uh, it may not be adopted. And uh, some of you well know uh, what we call in our days living labs. Canada is really strong on this. Um, and uh, that's something we consider uh, in Europe also for accelerating uh, knowledge uh, transfer or adoption. I see, Roland, you have your, your hand up. You want to add to that question? I'll respond kind of that, yes, um, uh, Ag Canada is actually also going the route of, of um, living labs, and there's now this, this big call for agricultural climate solutions, which focuses on the question of carbon sequestration. But I had actually last summer a farmer here helping out in the house on some construction we did, and he is one of the conventional farmers that do canola wheat or canola snow rotations. And so I suggested to him, like, well, like you could get rid of some of your wheat problems by switching in a legume. And so I said, well, I would love to switch in a legume, but it cost me 200 grand to build a, to buy a new cedar and a new harvest engine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a different question I want to ask, though, and, and that's with respect to, to carbon decomposition. Um, researchers at AFC, Henry Jensen, Ed Gregorich, and uh, Ben Allard have, have done this 15-year residue study, and they monitored uh, residue decomposition, and found after the 15 years that the decomposition was very well explain explainable by growing degree days, so temperature, and moisture, even though they incorporated um, uh, measurements from, from out east, which is a lot more moist than, than our west. Uh, that seem to play a very minor role in the whole decomposition rate, which kind of doesn't bode well to the whole plan of sequestering carbon if our decomposition starts speeding up. Because that essentially means like we need to uh, input more and more carbon in the first place. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on that with respect to the four per mil. So let, let me try to give a short answer and then to Pete, because Pete, you could explain far more on this. Um, yes, it is really a question. And I would not deny that uh, we have a problem there. But my, my way of thinking would be uh, we need to take action quickly, because unless we take action quickly, global warming would be so strong and uh, so devastating for soils and agriculture that indeed you would not get any chance to preserve your soil carbon stocks. But uh, I leave it to you, Pete, to comment more on soil processes. Yeah, not much to add, John Francois. I think in the um, maybe we'll take it offline in the uh, in the you know because we're getting short of time. I think. So to be continued, letting uh, Pete and Roland uh, carry on with their decomposition questions. We are going to move to uh, our next network, farm to regional scale integration. Uh, are, are you sharing, I guess, close uh, De Blitz and Yelta Zimmer, our co-leads of that? And uh, we've all our networks have had meetings recently, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about um, how you are coming together. <laughs> okay. I can see your screen, and okay, we can hear you now. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, it's it's not in the full presentation mode. Are you able no, to? No, I'm just doing that. Just a sec, should it's now? That works. All right, so hello, my name is Klaus Deblitz, um, and uh, here are the pictures of the three people that are also here today. Uh, basically, we took over uh, the farm and regional scale integration network uh, 
coordination or code sharing. And uh, yeah, so uh, it's me uh, on the left, and I, we have my colleague Yelto Zimmer and Nina Grasnik, who is already known to some of you from the GRI Secretariat, I'm, I suppose. And um, so Yalto and I, we are both in the Thunen Institute of uh, Farm Economics. Um, so uh, the Thunen Institute is a federal research center under the auspices of the Ministry of Agriculture. But we like to say that we are rather uh, independent. So we have an own statute. So we are not a, not, um, a department of the ministry. And Nina is uh, basically the member of the coordination unit, climate and soil. Um, and uh, yeah, and, 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 and I've, we try to follow a little bit, um, Pamela, what you put there as questions. Um, and uh, so the main achievement for this year, which is just uh, less than a month ago, we had this uh, kickoff meeting and, uh, um, and, and we actually try to link activities um, in this um, group here uh, with our experience globally, which is actually coming from the agri-benchmark uh, network. So that's a global network of, uh, of uh, researchers, producers, and advisors, and we try to help, yeah, to help understand global agriculture. Uh, and we basically collect data on agricultural production systems and their economics. Um, and that is an annual exercise we do with updates, with um, databases, with uh, conferences, etc., and publications. And we also um, do uh, more and more comprehensive practice change analysis, uh, mainly targeted to greenhouse gas uh, mitigation. Uh, in my case, where I, uh, I'm responsible for the livestock sector, it's also a lot of animal welfare, as you can imagine. And you see the map here where you basically see um, global research alliance countries with the green dot. It's not so well visible, visible, but then you see our network countries and we found that there is quite a strong uh, overlap. So in this kickoff meeting, um, we, uh, we met uh, quite some interest and I think Nina will uh, explain a little bit more about this. Yeah. Thank you, Klaus. So as Klaus mentioned already, we had the kickoff or rather relaunch meeting uh, one month ago and with, with what we thought quite good attendance. So we had 48 participants and um, the minutes of the uh, meeting are also ready now and um, pending for feedback from the network. So we will be able to share this on the GIA website soon and also the recordings of the meeting. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so before, so during the registration process for the meeting, we asked the participants to fill out a short survey and here you see the results for the registered participants. And we can see that there, we had quite some diversity uh, with regard to um, representation of world regions. So we had um, more or less all world, world regions represented, though still a strong focus on Europe. So this might be also something to um, consider for the next meetings. Um, and we also see a diversity regarding to production systems that um, people are analyzing. So a strong focus on livestock, but also um, researchers um, focusing on mixed systems and crops only. And we were also happy to see that many participants are already involved in farm level mitigation, mitigation research, but also um, quite amount of people who have experience in upscaling farm level data to the regional level so that we could also really, um, there, there's quite some potential to also um, achieve the aim of the um, network to then um, go from farm to regional scale. And yeah, I think with this, I hand over to Yeltu. Uh, no, it's me again. Sorry, Klaus again here speaking. So um, we decided on a, on a rather humble work plan because uh, to be honest, we didn't really want to overload uh, the whole activity from the start. So what the people found was um, that we first should uh, create a literature or research database on, on, on results from uh, members of the group. Uh, first uh, on farm level mitigation. Um, 
So whatever kind of uh, uh, farm level related activities here uh, in, 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 in practical terms are available. Um, and then we also said uh, that uh, upscaling from farm to region, anything that has been done uh, should actually be made uh, available to get this, this started as well. Um, our comfort zone, of course, is usually in the, on the farm level, as you can imagine, with our global network. Uh, so we are very grateful um, to, uh, to also include the knowledge uh, from uh, going from farm to, to region, upscaling uh, would be the word. And then um, uh, we, we did, um, we are still, we still have to do the uh, update of the website on the GRA. Um, we, uh, Nina recently created a LinkedIn group to foster the networking within the uh, farm to regional scale network. And uh, anything, um, uh, and anybody who would like to participate in this group, uh, please send a contact to, to Nina on LinkedIn. Uh, and we also decided to, to start a webinar series on farm level mitigation measures that will still be con uh, communicated, uh, supposed to start in, in September this year. Um, that is mainly to the, to the um, short time until uh, summer vacation starts in, in Europe and, and, and we are very late this year. So we, we only gonna be back in September. And then we also decided to have the next meeting in September, the date for that has to be uh, decided. <clears throat> um, on the question where we see topics and potential overlaps with other networks, uh, IRGs, um, we, we created a little list here um, and that's definitely not exhaustive and does not um, claim to be complete. But just to give you some examples of the uh, uh, topics and issues that were mentioned in the kickoff meetings by the, by, uh, by the participants. So the fertilizer manure input optimization was uh, one of the topics mentioned. And uh, we think that we could work here with the manure management or nutrient management group. Um, the crop and livestock management practices uh, would probably fit to the paddy rice and also to con convers conservation agriculture group. Benefits of agroforestry and silver partial systems could be linked to agroforestry system integrated crop and livestock systems. And then the cost and benefits of feed additives, uh, mainly for ruminants, of course, uh, would basically be a good match with the feed and nutrition group. I we had the pleasure to have uh, Andre Bunning from this group in our agri benchmark beef and sheep conference as a uh, and reporting about feed additives was most interesting. And uh, the soil uh, carbon sequestration, of course, that was uh, mentioned um, before. Uh, yeah, in the in the group with the same name. And um, I found interesting uh, when you when you uh, reported about this uh, survey. Uh, uh, Jean-François, uh, uh, the, 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 the knowledge needs that were mentioned was farm level economics and policy, which is actually um, where, 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 where we would put a focus here, uh, is about 68% of all the knowledge needs. So I think that, that fits rather well to this. And um, I think with this, I hand over to Yelto, uh, who is talking a little bit about more about um, uh, strategic uh, questions that were also addressed in the meeting. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Klaus. Uh, welcome to everybody here in the group. Indeed, uh, when we discussed about questions that are relevant to the members of our group, beyond those topics which are directly and ex exclusively linked to the farm level analysis, there were at least three major topics that we would like to share with you because we thought that they are beyond the interest of just the farm level analysis. And that is number one is the issue of leakage effects. Uh, as you probably experience yourself as well, uh, very often, especially policymakers tend to ignore them and just look at their backyard. And we think that as scientists, we have to have to discuss this issue because otherwise uh, we will end up with no actual uh, improvement if, if leakage effects are not accounted for. Uh, the other major topic also beyond this P2 
pure scope of our group was the topic of trade-offs between food security and greenhouse gas mitigations, uh, which is of course closely linked to that first part. So if you, if you go just for greenhouse gas mitigation at the expense of output, then of course, in an environment where food security is of, of relevance, then you immediately create a trade-off. And the last topic that was raised in our discussion was the perspectives of non-livestock proteins. Um, again, if you, if you ignore the trend that we see in a number of countries of people moving away from livestock proteins, uh, then of course the potential for savings in greenhouse gas emissions might be underestimated and therefore we thought that this might be also something that is of relevance to the entire research community, not just for the farm level uh, group. Uh, next page, please. Um, yeah, we would be curious to learn from the rest of the crowd here uh, who is already working in the field of farm economics. Uh, as, as has been mentioned before, there seems to be a real need for uh, improved and expanded farm economic research. And we would like to partner with those here in the group uh, who are interested in that topic. And the other topic that was raised during our meeting was whether and how we could contribute to any GRA contributions to COP26. At least we would express our willingness to be uh, involved in that debate. And uh, yeah, those who are responsible or who feel responsible, please reach out to that. And here we raise some funding opportunities, but I think we don't need to talk about that that much. Some of them have, have been mentioned already previously. Yeah, with that, I would like to conclude our presentation and uh, ask for any comments or suggestions from the group. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Klaus Yelto and Nina. Um, check the chat. Um, Carl Richards from Ireland has uh, suggested um, he can put you in contact with some farm economists. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other, um, really appreciate your effort to connect your work to some of the other networks um, and, and having put some thought to that um, following your meeting, that was really helpful. Um, Jean-Francois, you want to make a comment? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. And uh, my, my question, I think, is uh, about how can we synthesize internationally that work? I think you have extremely relevant questions on uh, how would uh, mitigation actions come with costs for farmers and what would be the implications for food production, food security. Uh, but a way to uh, create some uh, uh, understanding of this has been uh, by creating some uh, max curves. And uh, we know of uh, some countries which have developed max curves. Do you think that your work uh, on those uh, marginal abatement cost curves, uh, well, sorry, that your work could lead to improvements uh, with those marginal abatement cost curves? Um. Maybe I start and maybe Klaus can add. Uh, indeed, yeah, that, that is, uh, I would even argue that's the, at the heart of what we currently do at ArguBenchmark in respective projects to, to, to generate really uh, deep insights about the dynamics at the farm level if you want to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from either livestock or crop production. Yeah, I, just, I agree, 100%. Uh, that's a good point, thank you. Mm -hmm. So that's one way we can translate or, or share different kinds of 
um, results and is creating those kind of curves and using them, I guess, in different modeling exercises then. Um, oh, and, and Luke also has another connection for you there too in, uh, in the chat. Um, I would like us to move, I think, to our next one. We're, we're not doing too bad. Um, thank you for everyone for keeping with us along. Our next uh, network uh, to present is the Circular Food Systems, and they are just coming off. And I know, Karen, it's late there for you um, from their meeting this week. So um, again, um, uh, welcome and uh, happy to hear what you heard this week and where you're at in your process. Karen Anderboy. I can. Is it going to move to presentation mode? Sorry, guys, I'm not that familiar with Zoom. Um, can you see my screen? Because I cannot see you anymore. Right. We can see your screen. It's not in presentation mode. It's just uh, in the editing version. There it goes. And we do hear you. Oh, and I guess I will just mention um, apologies. Currently, our other co-chair was having, speaking of technical difficulties, uh, Lee Nelson was having issues um, and was actually going to drive into his office to maybe try and join us yet. So um, you good you can overcome some technical difficulties it's great yes <laughs> go ahead <laughs> i hate these online presentations and especially if it's in a program I, I i'm not very used to uh to zoom so this is the first time i share a presentation in zoom apologies if uh, something goes wrong um hi everybody my name is karen anderweg i uh, work for wageningen university and research wageningen livestock research uh, in the netherlands um and I had the honor to uh, kickstart this uh, circular food systems uh, network in the past uh, months. Um, we actually had our kickoff meeting uh, yesterday and uh, Tuesday. So uh, everything that I'm going to share is uh, quite fresh and new. Um, yep, that worked, this worked, right? Uh, short history. Um, the exploring the concept of circular food system started in uh, 2018. Um, then the GRA uh, agreed to establish this new network on circular food systems. Uh, uh, the Integrated Research Group agreed to host it. Uh, and in 2021, uh, the Netherlands government provided funding to support um, the coordination of the network, but also to support uh, new research. Um, so yesterday of this or this week, we had our formal uh, kickoff meeting. Um, uh, and this year we will also start with developing some uh, regional case studies on uh, opportunities of circular food systems for greenhouse gas mitigation. Uh, and what we're going to do next, that's still to, uh, to be defined. Um, I think it was in 2019, the objective of the Circular Food Systems Network was formulated as uh, contributing to food security uh, with mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions by circularity and looking at the total food system. Um, and of course, this is in the, it says we do that by, but this is what the, the, the normal way of the GRA uh, networks uh, um, have tried, tries to operate. Um, I would like to take you back uh, to, uh, to earlier this week. Uh, we had over 50 participants from uh, 50 continents. Uh, in April, we sent out a call for abstracts for people uh, wanting to share their view on circular uh, food systems in their country or in their region. Um, we received 51 abstracts uh, with a quite variety of topics within uh, circular food systems. Um, 10 of those abstracts were selected for a short communication and a, a video presentation. If I'm able to find the link later on and uh, I'm able to share it, then I can send you some of the link to those nice uh, videos because uh, the, some people really made an effort to um, make a nice video out of it. Um, participants were mainly uh, researchers, but we also had some people from the private sector and policymakers who were involved in the, in the meeting. Um, and what was quite interesting was that two thirds uh, of the participants were not yet active uh, in the GRA. So it seems like we're getting some new people into this GRA uh, uh, network. 
uh, we asked people like, what, what, what are you looking for? Why do you, why do you join this meeting? Um, and the main reason was that they wanted to connect with other researchers for knowledge sharing, but also for future uh, collaboration uh, on the theme of circular food systems. Oh yeah, and the drawings, um, uh, we had this live cartoonist that was joining the meeting and she was just drawing um, like 15 pictures of the discussion that researchers had. So afterwards she presented it and it was quite reflecting like, oh, so yeah, we are a bunch of researchers discussing very complex things and she makes nice cartoons out of it. So uh, my presentation has some of those cartoons to uh, give you a little impression of the, of the meeting. Um, discussion on content. Uh, I want to take you along a little bit in this in this discussion. Um, we discussed the, the level on which uh, nutrient cycles should be closed if you're looking to a circular food system, or what at least what people think um, on what level they should be closed. Um, the outcome was a, a regional a scope, but also um, at a level uh, on which greenhouse gases are best mitigated. So I'm not saying it should be close on farm level or on country level or regional level, it could also be on global level, at, it, at least if the greenhouse gases are, um, uh, emissions are going down. Some focus point for improving circularity in the food system uh, was to work on improving resource use efficiency, uh, minimize nutrient losses, also including food waste, uh, food waste from the processing industry, um, but also from restaurants, households, uh, supermarkets. Um, and to reuse unavoidable, unavoidable food waste uh, or other waste streams, for example, for uh, animal feed, but also soil improvement. Soils was mentioned as one of the important things to uh, use the nutrients in your uh, food system for. Something else that was stressed was that it was not should not only be about uh, greenhouse gas mitigation, but other other co-benefits of circular food systems, such as climate adaptation uh, and resilience, but also income and jobs, food security, nutrition security, um, healthy diets, uh, biodiversity in nature. Um, there was a remark that um, the discussion tend to focus a little bit on technical issues, but that social, economic, and organizational aspects of uh, improving circularity in your food system should also be uh, addressed um, and the need to find a good indicator or probably a set of indicators um, that could measure the impact or the effect on greenhouse gas emissions but also on biodiversity adaptation um, in, a, in a food system. We asked the participants from what would you like to get out of this, out of this network? Um, and what would you like to bring to the network? Um, one of the uh, focus points that the network um, uh, should focus on uh, was to facilitate, sorry, the, the letters are a little bit small, but also facilitate joint research, data sharing and new research projects um, and sharing knowledge, but also other aspects were found important like exchange of students and researchers and connecting uh, researchers with uh, policymakers. Uh, what people would like to bring, well, you can see there's a quite a broad range of ideas, but the main thing the, the, that came out of it was uh, being a research partner and uh, collaborate on uh, new knowledge development. Um, so we had this, this, this one day plenary session and then we had some time zone workshops uh, in which we enabled uh, participants to discuss the possibilities for developing a case study together on circular food system in a certain region. Um, this is a very full slide I'm going to show you, but this is uh, what I captured during the meeting as uh, outcomes and ideas for case studies. Um, and we are very lucky that, uh, that we have the funding available from the Netherlands government uh, to fund several case studies. So in the next um, weeks, we are going to discuss this with uh, the participants to see uh, if, new collaborations can be set up uh, to work on uh, circular food system or aspects of circular food systems in um, certain regions. Uh, we also had some topical uh, breakout sessions and case studies on insects, technologies to improve byproducts, uh, grassland systems and uh, rice systems. 
Um, and especially for these, we're also looking for the grasslands and the rice to, to collaborate with uh, the other GRA networks. How should we stay in contact? That was one of the questions that we had as uh, coordinators um, and that we've also discussed before uh, among others with Hazel, what is a good way to keep, to, to stay in touch with your, with your network? Um, so this is kind of what people advised as webinars, but also LinkedIn groups, newsletters, uh, WhatsApp group, I'm not sure if that would really work, but. Um, so what's next? So we had this kickoff workshop. Uh, we will start some regional case studies, um, set up communication channels. Um, I heard in the former presentation also the idea of having a GRA contribution or maybe an IRG contribution at uh, COP26. Uh, for me, that's a big question mark if that would be possible, uh, but it might be good to discuss that um, uh, with the whole uh, IRG group. Um, and in 2021 to have the uh, outcomes of the states the case studies, uh, focus on facilitating joint research, financing new research, looking for uh, funding uh, opportunities, uh, but also definitely it's not on this slide, but uh, that should be part of it is um, uh, reach out to policymakers. Some needs and uh, requests from our side. Uh, we would very much like to establish linkages with other network. Um, we are starting a case study on circularity and rice systems. Uh, and one of the requirements that I gave them is to connect with the Petty Rice Group. Uh, but we would also like to uh, connect with the Inventories and NDC uh, support group. It's Crop Livestock and Agroforestry, just to see to what extent we can harmonize um, approaches and methodologies um, and share knowledge. Um, We would also very much like to contribute to communication or uptake of case study results in, I don't know, policy briefs. I heard Hayden say policy briefs. I'm not sure what, uh, what you have on your planning um, to do this year. Um, and something that I find very interesting is to, is to see the, to, to look at the possibilities for exchange of students and researchers. That was for now what I wanted to tell you. Thanks, Karen, for sharing that. That uh, live cartoonist um, is a very interesting idea and way to, uh, as you say, bring the meeting to, to life here. Um, does, is there a question for Karen at all about, this is a very new group and very broad ranging topic. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, Hayden. And yes, you've, you've identified a, a lot of potential connections there too. Oh, Jean-Francois. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Karen. Uh, such uh, an entertaining uh, presentation and uh, really informative. Thank you so much. Um, my, my question is really about uh, how would you see uh, metrics for uh, calculating the rate of circularity in a food system? Mm -hmm. I know this is a tricky question, and uh, I guess it is more of a research topic than uh, really uh, something you could answer easily. But um, it would be quite fascinating uh, if uh, this could be discussed further so that when you run your case studies, uh, it would be possible to uh, compare these systems uh, on uh, some metrics. Maybe there's not a single metric, but maybe there are some. So I'm, I'm really uh, curious to know uh, what is your thinking about it? That's a very good question. Uh, thank you, uh, Jean-Francois. Um, well, I think at this moment, there is no metrics. Uh, I know there are a lot of people working on the metrics of how can we measure circularity. Um, I'm involved in this uh, uh, research project in the Netherlands to develop a set of uh, key um, performance indicators uh, to advance uh, circular agriculture, but that's quite a job because you need it for different systems and uh, like life cycle analysis or carbon footprint printing doesn't really work because that's very much focused on um, uh, a supply chain level and doesn't um, help you to uh, integrate 
the, the, the different like the, the, the crop and the livestock uh, systems. Um, during the meeting, we also had a presentation from uh, Martin van Itzen, um, and he will very soon publish um, new research uh, in which he uh, presents an indicator for circularity, which is uh, named the cyclical count. Um, cyclical, yeah, cyclical count, and it counts how many times a nutrient uh, goes around in the system before it leaves the system. That's clever. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure how he calculates it, but at least we will we will learn it soon when he publishes his uh, his research. And I think there was a comment in the chat. Uh, yes, uh, Luke is asking about the um, risk, I guess, here. Um, here, to what extent are biosecurity, human and health, animal health risks being assessed and addressed? And yeah. we could be a and look, better advocates I, I, I for greater, then... greater reuse if it was done safely, or we could do risk it. Yes, and uh, look, are you then referring uh, referring to um, uh, reusing human uh, excreta in the in your food system, or I also guess animal manures? I guess there's a range of of issues, isn't there? So uh, heavy metals with biosolids, or um, mm -hmm. yeah. in the UK, we've had some unfortunate experiences with the recycling of materials as, as in co-products as livestock feeds, uh, you know, so BSE and foot and mouth disease, yeah. those kind of yeah. things. So I guess there's a lot of interest in kind of increased circularity, but it feels like there's also a lot of attendant risks that we need to try and mitigate. And I was just wondering the extent to which those are being included within the within the work of the group. Um, and well, in the case studies that were proposed at this moment, it is not included, but I do know that it's uh, very much included also in political debate. Uh, the European Union just passed a law uh, in which um, residues of, of animals are allowed to be used in animal feed again. Um, my colleagues at the Animal Health Department are also working on um, what are the effects if you provide a different kind of feed to your animals to the, the welfare and the health of the, of the animals. Um, so what they say is you should really center the health and the well-being of the animal if you're looking at the circular food system. So what can it eat mm -hmm. uh, and what can it produce? Um, and then you design your system around that uh, animal. Um, but I think it's a, this is quite a new um, area of work in which there are lots and lots of knowledge questions. So indeed, maybe um, uh, a linkage with the animal health uh, network. Is it still existing? I think so. Yeah. In the livestock research group, but that might also be very, uh, very interesting. Great, thank you. Great, thanks, Karen. Um, Roland, I think I have to ask you to enter your question in the uh, the chat there. I want to uh, make sure we get through all our, our network uh, presentations here. Our last one is uh, from Hazel Tomlin. Uh, and Nagoni is maybe there too, uh, with the inventories and NDC support network. Yeah, she's You're muted, Hazel. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. <laughs> Thanks, Pamela. Just let me know when you can see my screen. Yeah. Coming up now, um, we just need, there you go. Perfect. All right, so I am like you said, Pamela Hazel Tomlin. Um, I've already met many of you on the call. I've been looking at who's participating through my role as one of the GRA Secretariat. But today I'm giving the presentation for the Inventories and Nationally Determined Contributions Network, wearing my hat as one of the current network co-leads and on behalf of Richard Eckert, who can't make it today, and Ngoni Turinder, who is here on the meeting, but I think it's quite late for him. So he may have something to add, but he may not. Um, and Karen, I think your presentation was great with the live cartoonist. I unfortunately don't have anything like that to share, but, but that's okay. So I think everyone is really familiar with the different networks of the GRA and of the IRG. Um, this is obviously where the inventories and NDC network fits in. 
And I do feel that the Inventories and NDC Network is potentially the most cross-cutting network of the GRA, as nearly all research that is done by the other networks can in some way feed back to national inventories and nationally determined contributions decisions. So as a brief overview, the Inventories and NDC Network is for researchers and policymakers and decision makers in charge of prioritizing inventory funds and setting emission reduction targets and implementing mitigation strategies. Um, essentially, the end goal is always to tangibly reduce emissions that would otherwise be emitted. So by working together as the Inventories and NDC Network, we are hoping to enable inventory compilers to improve the accuracy with which they are reporting their emissions and to account for mitigation in their inventories. I think everyone's familiar with the old adage that what is not measured is not managed and inventories do therefore remain the main tool for setting emission reduction targets and tracking our progress towards those. So our main focus as the inventories and NDC network is to share the latest scientific research and new emission factors and methodologies and gather and distribute activity data, and in general, just stories of progress from our members. So we are always looking to hear from you, the other networks, and also our wider membership. I'm sure that everyone in this plenary fully understands that it's really crucial. We ensure we are building in-country capability related to inventory management and agricultural mission policy, rather than outsourcing. Um, which is why we're also focused on technical trainings and data sharing. Just managing two screens, the joys of virtual presentations. <laughs> so as we all know, 2020 was quite a strange year. Um, we have managed to achieve still, I think, a lot of progress with the inventories and nationally determined contributions network. So it's hard to know exactly how many members we have, but our subscription to our um, Who's Counting newsletter and other communications that we do via that mailing list over the past year has almost doubled, um, most of which has come from directly approaching individuals and also aligning with other similar international research networks. So last year, we prepared four quarterly Who's Counting network newsletters um, those are all linked in this presentation, so you can go and check those out if you haven't already received them. And the newsletter is now electronic, which makes it more accessible for people where English is not their first language as well. Um, I've also included the subscription link to our communications in this slide. At the start of this month, we hosted two research updates meetings for our network with presentations of some of the GRA research partners that we're working with on inventory capability building initiatives. Um, we did have nearly 60 particip participants across both of those sessions. And we had presentations from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the AFOLU Task Force on National Greenhouse Gas Inventories, the Technical Support Unit, bit of a mouthful, but that was really good and also the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, um, the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre, Andreas Wilkes, who's on the call, gave that one, um, the Greenhouse Gas Management Institute, and also the Low Carbon Livestock Research Network's Inventory Development Subgroup, uh, and the FAO Enhanced Transparency Framework Network. So that was really... Great. I don't mean to interrupt you too much. Hey, oh, there you go. We, we might be one slide behind. Ah. Um, we're looking at the alignment and funding one right now, just so you know. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes, maybe you were. <laughs> um, so the present presenters in our recent collaboration meetings are representatives from the international partners that we've aligned with for the inventories and NDC network. We don't have any dedicated funding for our activities above and beyond the time of the network co-leads, which is supported by our respective institutions. But by aligning with other networks and groups, we can contribute to other research calls and other initiatives. So good examples of that are the recent submission by Ningoni and some of our other inventories and nationally determined contributions, members and colleagues to the Circular Food Systems Network, 
the call on circularity and greenhouse gas emissions in the Mediterranean food system is what they prepared. And also earlier in the year, Hayden connected us with the Low Carbon Livestock Research Network. So we're now aligned with the inventory development subgroup that I mentioned. Um, and we are doing a bunch of kind of coordination and collaboration meetings across the US, New Zealand and Australian government initiatives in this space. So next slide now. Um, we do have several plans for 2021 and 2022, some of which are further along than others. We plan to connect to continue to connect directly with national agriculture sector inventory compilers, and we hope to see increasing subscription to our communications just to get the information out there more widely. Um, we are hoping to host an agriculture sector inventory compilers workshop where we can connect and share, I guess, common challenges that are being faced by inventory compilers and in inventory management internationally. Um, we have already received encouragement by the UNFCCC Secretariat and also the IPCC Technical sorry, Task Force on Inventories to conduct this activity. Um, so we're looking to do that probably in the next few months. And there are a number of other initiatives which we're contributing to and working on. So we're doing a summary of the 2019 requirement to the 2006 IPCC National Guidelines for Greenhouse Gas Inventories. We're doing a stock take of um, international, nationally determined contributions for agriculture and also the state of all of the different inventories. That's kind of an ongoing piece. Um, we are currently in the process of writing a proposal to prepare a set of guidelines for using the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Emission Factor Database, and also looking at how we can make sure that emission factors that might be relevant for that database can be kind of pulled together and submitted. Um, we're also considering doing a, some specific webinars on technical topics. Yeah, so I just included that slide to show how I guess the inventories and NDC network, but all of our networks really are aligned with the objectives of the GRA. And yeah, thanks everyone. Please do subscribe to our newsletter and yeah, please pass on our details to your national experts in agricultural inventories and NDCs. Um, yeah, and feel free to let me know if you have any questions. I know Ningoni might have some responses as well. Thank you. That's great, Hazel. Thank you. It's a, it's a very um, practical network. Um, uh, not always so many research papers, right? But other kinds of products that you guys work on. Mm -hmm. Any questions for, for Hazel and Nagoni? Well, um, oh, Jean-Francois. Okay, it seems like I'm the only one asking questions. Sorry for this. But uh, yes, thank you so much, Hazel. I'm, I'm really impressed by all the progress you could do. Uh, and I, I'm so happy this is developing. To me, it's essential we get this. And uh, well, my, my question is quite simple, really. Uh, I think you are in, uh, in need of having uh, more data uh, you know, from emission factors uh, that are really locally established and published and so on. So how could we help you in getting those uh, values? And uh, I think that being integrated research group, uh, we should help, I guess. Yeah, that's a really great question, actually. And I do agree with you that we are in need of that data. I guess the question is, does that data already exist in some places that we're not aware of? And do we need to get it to kind of a central location and shared more widely? Um, I think emission factors and activity data can be really useful to the wider region than, than just the specific country that um, it may be kind of developed and collected in. So I'm not actually too sure how to answer that question, um, <laughs> but it is a really great question. Yeah, we can think on uh, that. I, I'm, I'm certainly not sure, but, but on the one hand, uh, there might be uh, some... Uh, for instance, what we could do is uh, maybe try to get funding for meta-analysis mm -hmm. of uh, the published literature. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure all has been assessed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is that there are some reports, for instance, we have a number of projects for European Commission uh, where you have deliverables, where you could find emission factor values. 
And I'm unsure if those were reported or not. And uh, yeah, well, I leave it to Hyde, and certainly you have thoughts about this Hyde. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, well, just to say, um, uh, as kind of what you were just suggesting, for, uh, suggesting John Francois, that you know, there would be published research or research activities that could lead to emissions factors, but they probably don't go to full full extent and, and, and there needs to probably be a more deliberate um, reporting of that information into the RPCC emissions factor database or yeah, having someone compile it in the right format to be an emissions factor and not just an interesting study somewhere. Um, there's a lot of interesting studies out there, but do they meet the sort of criteria for being a national emissions factor or not, or, or regional emissions factor or whatever the case might be. Um, so that would certainly be useful. Um, and in some of the research that at least we've had some more direct influence over, we try and ask for that as part of the deliverables of the research project is that they actually submit to the mission sector database. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Luke, did you have a comment or question? Yeah, well, it was, it was just to endorse what Hayden was saying, really. I mean, it's a bit of a sort of depressing read sometimes the old IPCC emission factor database not not quite as much makes its way into there as, as perhaps would be the case and we've certainly had a big push on, on getting stuff in there Hayden's right it's a bit of a slog getting things into the right format and um, you know you, you have to answer interesting questions at review stage but I think um, if we can encourage people to get that database to where it should be then I think it would, it would be a fantastic resource for studies of the kind that Jean-Francois suggested analysis and Roland uh, yeah so in, in my case I actually work quite closely with the uh, Environment Canada who is uh, who have the national inventory group for agriculture greenhouse gas emissions and there is a memorandum of understanding between us and them uh, but what we found in the in the past is that the national inventory requirements for emission factors and how are things calculated are quite distinct different from the scientific interest. And so there's, there's one thing so to say to create a new emission factor and figure out like how to best describe it and calculate it. And the other part of how do we actually fit this into the inventory? And so we just had this with the revised into emission factor for Canada, where we first published a paper, basically here's the new equation. And everybody was like, oh yeah, great. You're gonna include Soil texture, and then the national inventory came back and said, "Well, we don't actually have soil texture. Like we can't use that. So we basically had to to revamp the whole thing and and move it back to the old calculation method. So to say in an update to that. But so in, in that saying, uh, what, what we find so say, is there is a requirement, I think, to work with the national inventory group to see what are their needs." But what they need doesn't always work with our scientific interest. That's a good point, Roland. Thank you, uh, Roland. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Roland. I, just, I just had in the chat a short uh, suggestion. Uh, let's see uh, later. Uh, we, I think, uh, Heiden, you explained we will have a stock take. So could it be that we would uh, try to to you know, have some dedicated questions about emission factors in that stock uh, I understand from you what you said, Roland, it's nothing easy, but, but maybe we could try this, I'm not sure. Sure, sure. And can I just make a quick addition to Roland's point? That's exactly right. And it's the activity data side that is probably as or more important than the emissions factor side. Um, and the activity data is effectively the structure of the inventory, you know, that sort of parameters and things that would need to be accompanied in some cases by those emissions factors. And, I guess activity data is not an interesting paper, right? It's just that hard slog that someone has to do at some point, but it's not going to make a high impact journal necessarily. And so how do you promote um, better activity data collection so that, yeah, generating very specific emission factors if they have no home, that's kind of put on the shelf. Um, yeah, but let's think about it in the stock take as well as, well, across the, across the research groups in general. Hazel, do you want to make a quick response to that? And then I think we need to go to our breakouts. Yeah, just a quick final comment to say that I think these are all really great ideas and meta analysis of emission factors. And I do believe, I can't remember who just put that in the chat um, from Chagas, the methane emission factor meta analysis. I think I've already read that one as well. And it was really good, good and really comprehensive. Um, but I, I see all of this as essentially coming back to the network. Um, 
And I think it will be really, really important for us to connect with the agriculture sector inventory compilers because they're the ones that are aware of what data exists. Um, so if we can pull everyone together, then that can kind of be the foundational point to then move onwards into something like meta-analysis or pulling together data. So I think that that's really the first stepping stone, which is which is really good. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, we are a little behind time, but I, I think it's worthwhile to try our breakouts. So again, this is part of our, our trials for a virtual meeting of this. And I think we're just going to break into two breakout groups, um, but that will give us just a bit smaller group. There's three questions in the um, agenda, um, learn, focusing on how we can be integrative or what you've heard today, where we can make some connections between um, some of the different research groups and networks, links and synergies, and just what does it mean for us to be, um, what kind of outputs, and maybe the submission factor discussion is uh, one of them or meta-analyses, that kind of thing. So I would invite, I guess, Deborah to start up the breakouts for us. Um, we'll spend maybe just 15 minutes, I think, in that, and just have you know a brief, very brief report back um, when we come back at about five minutes uh, to the hour, I think, if that will work. Here we go. So please join your, um, join your room.
for thank you, Deborah. Everyone, no, that's for making the magic happen. Sometimes there's more of a countdown, like you'll be leaving in a minute or so many seconds, and there wasn't any of that. So, oh, oh okay, I, I, I didn't see it. Um, it, was. A minute. Yes. it was just yeah. a standard minute, okay. Yeah. Just, mm -hmm. We were good, we wrapped up. Um, I guess, uh was hoping to have just a brief uh, report back. I think we had two groups. Um, was anybody from my group like to give just some a couple highlights from our discussion rather than me talking? I didn't ask for a volunteer ahead of time. I can get, just give a, a, a quick summary. I was take, trying to take a couple notes. Um, in terms of being integrative, um, I think we uh, discussed that uh, sharing is kind of the precondition. We need to find good ways to share um, sort of what we know. Uh, there were two sort of um, ideas, I guess. Uh, one was around the emission factors and, and this connection between sort of the, the work that maybe more um, specific networks are doing and then the work that the inventories and NDC group is doing um, with more of those compilers and whatnot. And Hazel kind of said, that's really the reason the network exists. But I think um, reaching back to the separate networks um, and helping to translate or, or letting researchers know how it needs to be produced or, or relatable to these, these inventories to be really um, the most useful in these global exercises. Um, also recognizing that um, uh, soils inter in, underpin a lot of the work, and and so as we um, often as we move to the, the system level, like either, whether it's a farm farm level in particular, where um, you know crops and livestock are, are integrated, and the soils is kind of one of the uh, pieces that are within the IRG. That um, it's another perspective uh, that there's models that the soil carbon sequestration groups been working on. Um, that could fit into these other um, exercises and then provide knowledge and advice from all the work they've been, been doing. Um, yeah, so the, the moving to the whole system. And I guess we sort of ended on uh, wanting to, where, where's the impetus for our science? We were, scientists were able to come together, uh, well, probably with, with governments and the private sector to make a vaccine in a, in a year for COVID when there's a lot of impetus and what sort of Where's, where's going to be the breakthrough for the GRA and can we um, summarize in some way the last 10 years of work and what, what were some of those breakthrough moments um, and ideas, but then uh, there was a connection also being made to the sustainable development goals that have, you know, a very short uh, nine seasons, I guess, to, to reach and are there some key um, learnings from uh, the GRA, from the IRG network, networks that can support those um, and that might be a driver and accelerant for um, getting some of our, our work um, used and, and brought together. Anything else people from my group heard? Oh no, I'm frozen. Okay, Jean-Francois, okay, <laughs> we're good. Any highlights from your, your group, Jean-Francois? Yes, and uh, actually, I, I'm also reporting from that group. Uh, so, um, uh, yes, and just just a few a few uh, short commands. Uh, uh, I think we we had a first uh, a, a conversation on how could you integrate across the networks, and uh, we said, uh, well, there are lots of possibilities. Uh, uh, the farm scale network can integrate uh, many things uh, at the farm scale. And we heard about this, uh, and it can open uh, uh, this uh, economic uh, box, which is uh, so powerful. Um, and then we heard about uh, uh, obviously uh, the inventories and NDCs, where you could uh, also integrate many of those uh, emission factor data and uh, maybe some of the soil carbon data. Um, and uh, we, we said also the circular. Uh, Economy group uh, could uh, could have a lot of uh, integrative uh, capacity because uh, it looks at uh, couple systems like no crops and livestock and so on. Um, well, and we we as you said, we also uh, said uh, indeed uh, soils uh, underpin uh, everything, and uh, 
therefore they are cross-cutting. And moreover, uh, we can look uh, not only at uh, the agricultural areas, but uh, also at some uh, uh, woodlands, uh, wetlands, and so on that are managed by farmers. And then you get into that landscape scale, which is also an integration. And uh, I would say you, you are more in line with nature-based solutions and so on. However, we, we were then criticizing a bit things uh, by saying, uh, uh, are we only describing? Uh, so maybe we are integrating, but all, only you know, uh, describing existing systems, existing practices, and not being able to suggest any change. So there I said, look, uh, we have this uh, co-benefit uh, network that will be presented tomorrow by, by Cynthia. And uh, there they will uh, use a suite of uh, models spanning adaptation and mitigation and, uh, they could, and economics, and they could well actually come up with new designs, uh, you know, uh, systems that would be uh, better for the future. Um, and uh, this was, I think, uh, accepted, uh, but there were also some uh, even broader uh, discussions about, uh, however, uh, you could imagine such systems uh, with a computer, but uh, are they going to happen? Uh, because of the lock-ins, uh, you know, the systems uh, of uh, many uh, interactions that we uh, sometimes uh, find difficult to capture, like uh, do we have rebound effects? Do we have uh, feed food competition? Uh, how do we interact with the uh, really food systems, uh, like the diets, the food waste and losses? Um, well, so, so I must say, uh, to some, we were opening a bit the Pandora box here, mm -hmm. and uh, there were comments saying, uh, yes, but uh, we should still look more into the role of innovation and technologies, and so rather than transforming your system, uh, try to uh, you know, improve existing system, basically. So I think this was, uh, in a nutshell, a very interesting conversation. So thanks to all, and uh, open to, to comments and uh, I may have forgotten a number of things, obviously. So, any additional additions to that conversation? It sounded very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone, for participating today. Um, this was sort of the warm up, really, to the second plenary, where we'll have a longer time to sort of talk about. Um, the kinds of outputs and, and work planning ideas, projects, um, uh, you know, maybe not so much brainstorming, maybe focusing in on a couple of things that we really want to maybe put on our plate for the next year or so. Um, there's some interesting opportunities, I think, that have been raised um, by the networks tonight. Um, I wish tomorrow morning's uh, country sessions well. Um, I will not be there. That's a little too early, but I know uh, uh, some of our other yeah. folks will be there. And yes. uh, any other comments you wanted to add, Jean-Francois, before I close? No, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela. And uh, thank you all. Uh, I think uh, yeah, I, I'm delighted to see uh, that uh, we, we had really great inputs. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm especially delighted to see that these networks are really working hard and developing things very quickly. Actually, So uh, this is a great opportunity. And uh, Let's see how we perform tomorrow compared to today. <laughs> and uh, thanks again, everybody. Yes. Have a good night's rest, and we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.